a very, very warm welcome to everyone. Uh, it gives me such great pleasure uh, to be here uh, for a book discussion uh, with Dr. Pratiksha Sharma. I've known uh, Dr. Sharma for nearly a decade now. And um, it really seems, I mean, I, I'm just so happy that we're being able to do this. Uh, I think you were sort of uh, involved in some of our initial conversations when we had just set up the Red Door, Reshma Valiapan and myself. So it really feels like a you know, complete circle at this point. Uh, Dr. Sharma, uh, the, I, mean, I have lots of questions for you and we have very little time, but I'm hoping that we'll get to you know, most of the conversations that we want to have uh, this evening. Um, I'll begin with asking you about the name of the book, right? And within that, I'm sure are contained multiple stories, your own personal trajectory, uh, your learnings, and really, I mean, in a way, your, uh, your, your developed understanding over the last 30 years, uh, which is something you keep saying whenever we uh, chat. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Aparna, and thank you all for making the time to come here and listen to this discussion. And I'm, I'm sorry, I feel like, I feel as though I'm bragging at times when I say 30 years, but out of those 30, for the first 18 odd years, I was a patient only. So I was not really uh, playing any role of any kind of an analyst or understanding anything. But of course, I was very curious to understand mental health issues. Uh, some, some of you may be aware that I had a, a diagnosis of bipolar and uh, I was on medication. So I've been through the entire spectrum of what, it, what a person goes through, which includes uh, all kinds of antipsychotic, antidepressants. ECTs and you name it kind of treatments which a person has gone through. From 2011 onwards till about 2015, I published about myself, which was in research. And thereafter, I got an opportunity for PhD work. And it was a very natural thing that if I had recovered, what was it that was holding other people back in the mental health system? So that became a very natural side of a progression from an individual to a more societal kind of a, you know, an attempt to understand that thing. So, um, and that is the PhD journey was until 2020 and thereafter the book. Now, uh, when I say the word psychiatric subjectivation, we have to go back to the work of Michael Foucault, a French theorist who gave the idea that whatever is in there in society in, in, a, in a consolidated form is mostly how people are being managed as, as being governed, you know? So we, we look at any institution, whether it is a school or a college, they have certain norms, how people are given structures of discipline and all of that. So he has looked at the governing of the person uh, as the, the most important thing that society plays actually. So. And uh, when we say the word subjectivation, so this is a, a peculiar thing to say, a peer investigation. A peer means somebody who has been into the mental health system, who understands, is at a lived experience from that perspective, who knows what it takes, uh, it, 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 it means to take the antidepressant, take the antipsychotic. I have been in those foggy states. I've been in those very, very heavily sedated states where I, I had no thought in my mind and you could sit in the room with me for hours and I would not utter a word. And for, not for a small time, but very, very long indeed. So I've been through all of that. So I understand people uh, when they're going through that also themselves. And uh, so when I come to Foucault here, uh, I want to bring in the idea of governing the patient, you know, and why the subjectivation word comes in. So when Foucault said that the majority of institutions in society are about governing the individual, which is the school, the college, and of course the total institutions are the jails and the asylums. They are the, like, they're, they're really the, the most stringent where you are sort of, uh, you know, your, your, your personhood is completely decimated and you don't matter, you don't, you're just a number over there. So that governability of the person, that governance of the person, that governmentality is when you become the psychiatric subject. And psychiatry is sitting like a master like a colonial master governing you and telling you this is the uniform you will wear, this is what you will eat, this is how you will stay, these are your barracks, this is the... I've worked in a jail also uh, for, a, for a while and I've seen how people are treated over there. So it was quite an eye-opener for me to see uh, a bit how dehumanizing it can be to be inside a jail 
and, and I've been a psychiatric patient, so uh, I've seen so many kinds of uh, these, uh, you know, attempts at how people are controlled by society in whatever name and whatever prejudice we, we uh, prejudicial view we look at them through, whether it is a convict or a, a patient or a, you know somebody who can be violent tomorrow or all that, whatever is uh, sort of said about psychiatric patients. So that subjectivation is the is what I have understood and why, so as we go over this whole thing, I will share further as to why this idea of subjectivation comes in and why is it that this relationship between psychiatry and the patient develops at all and what can be an alternative to that also. So, but um, Aparna, do you think um, this says something about the word subjectivation? Does it clarify? I think uh, it will be further clarified when we perhaps have a discussion on the idea of colonialism yes. and coloniality yes. that your book sort of speaks about extensively. You're right. So uh, could you perhaps uh, uh, you know, describe subject, uh, subject vibration through those lenses? lenses? Right, right, okay. So, uh, you know, uh, in a lot of scholarship, so do you think we should go sequentially as to why mad studies is there as a discipline at all? Why is there a new field called mad studies and are the people who are doing the field mad or is it, uh, you know, like what is it about mad studies which is the mad part of it, you know? So let me just uh, share with you that uh, mad studies actually began, I mean, people were writing about mental health issues in, under the larger umbrella of disability studies. And we, then they felt that uh, we have some peculiar issues which the disability discourse is not able to respond to. So we need to uh, look at our problems through a different kind of a lens. And we maybe need to look at the issues of mental health through, uh, through another kind of uh, little different discourse on the disability discourse. Now, as far as I'm concerned, I think that people who are suffering, they're not mad. Anybody can have a mad moment. You can have a mad phase. You can have tremendous deep suffering. But that doesn't make you mad for life. And to, to subject a person, subject, not that, you know, to subject a person in the name of that phase of life, of madness, or the, that angry, mad kind of, you know, response to life, uh, for life, if you put them on medication, uh, that is a very, very problematic thing indeed. And that is what needs to be questioned, that does a person need medication for life? And when they do, and because people are so, uh, uh, they're so accepting of the idea that, yeah, I'm a patient and I need to take medicine, uh, they don't question the authority of the, the professional and that, so the, the word mad studies is actually a response, uh, it's an anger, it's, it's not a mad, like a mad people doing it kind of thing, it's, you know, like, I'm, I'm so mad at you, that kind of thing, it's, so it's that mad, it's not the mad mad, like the way society calls the so-called mad people, and like I believe, I, like I said just now, that there is no madness, there is deep suffering, there is deep distress for which people are looking towards psychiatry for, for help, for succor, for some kind of a way out. And when psychiatry starts um, uh, medicating people, usually they don't stop the medication. I'm saying usually, maybe some doctors do, but I have not come across very many. So that disables them over time. I, I begin this book uh, with the story of a woman uh, who started her medication at about 15 or 16 years of age. And by the time I interview her in the book, she is 44. And by chance, today she sent me a message saying, ma'am, I've just been told by my doctor that I have a diagnosis of dementia. And she's just one year younger to me. So I was so shocked and pained and I said, oh my God. And hers is a very important story in this book. If you read the book, you, you'll see the whole her story is there, is running along like a red thread to the book. And in fact, one particular appendix is fully devoted to her as to how somebody enters the mental health system in the name of schizophrenia at 15 or 16 years of age. And by the time she's 44, how disabled she is. And, and, and today, she's about 50, and she 
tells me that she has a dementia diagnosis also. If, and she says that if I don't take this medication, I will probably go towards Alzheimer. And I said, please, let's, let's talk about this again because you're really going down the wrong path, you know. So this is the sad thing. So this is a very important story which I, I urge you all to, to take a look at. Her story, I call her Vindhya in the book, yeah. So this is the story of Vindhya and uh, how just because she's such a compliant patient, more than 30 years of medication, and how she has been progressively disabled. So this is my whole contention, that if people uh, don't get out of medication, it, they're only going to get more and more progressively disabled. So they don't come into the system, they don't start taking medication because they are disabled. They are in deep suffering. People seek psychiatric help because they're in suffering. But if you don't look for a way out apart from the medication, then you are going now towards disability. And that is my main contention. So which I think we can, we can also unpack further as we go along, yeah? Absolutely. Um, you know, you said, uh, you know, how, how people enter the system, right? They are in a place of great distress, as you put it. They are suffering when they enter, yeah. right? And really when the, the, the diagnosis first comes, there's almost a sense of relief. Right? It's almost like, oh, finally somebody understands me. And I love the term you use to describe that. You call it recognition capital. Finally you feel like there's someone who will listen to all the pain that you've been feeling all this while and somebody has actually given it a name now. Right? So if you could describe uh, in your own understanding and your study and you know, your own st uh, story as well, this, this trajectory, how does it begin? And then how does it sort of go further? And, and then, you know, like you said, a compliant patient like Vindhya, you know, what she has come to. I'm not saying everybody has to be no. like that, of course. But, uh, you know, if you could just sort of describe that entire journey the way you understand it. Yes. So I think, um, see, as a first line of action, when somebody is in deep suffering, uh, psychiatry is the most visible institution in society, the most legitimate, so-called legitimate, you know, where it has a lot of legitimacy, it has a lot of social power, where everybody is going to look for, for help and support. And so everybody will say, oh, mommy, please take me to the psychiatrist, papa, take me to the psychiatrist. So a lot of people do that because they think that my parents don't understand my problem, but perhaps the professional would, which indeed they do. But whatever they have by way of treatment is usually not dialogue is usually medication, because they are looking at behaviors of people. They are looking at how is this person reacting to whatever stresses they are fa facing, whether it's an exam stress or, or a heartbreak or some kind of a job loss or something, something, any, a death in the family. So that is what, so the, the, they are coming with the distress and they seemingly understand the distress very well. So they are the distress doctors. And when a doctor prescribes a pill, people think, yeah, yeah, uh, they, understand very well, they understand my problem very well, and therefore, now my problem is going to be solved. Whether the problem gets solved is a different issue, but now you've entered into the role of a patient. Now you are a psychiatric patient. You were just a fine person who entered the doctor's clinic, but by the time you come out, you're a patient after that. And it, it sort of hits everybody that, oh my God, I'm a patient now, so I, this is so serious. You know, this is like, I have a pill also now to prove it. So that recognition that my suffering is actually legitimate because it has a name also. Somebody understands that and it, it takes a professional to understand me. My mom cannot understand me, my sister, my brother, or, and this is not to invalidate psychiatry's claim to understanding suf uh, suffering and giving it a certain name, but I'm seeing psychiatrists sitting right in front of me, so I have to say that also, that disclaimer. <laughs> that, please, this is not just about beating the hell out of psychiatry, which is also part of my agenda. But sorry, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. But, uh, but, I would, uh, but I'm saying that um, there are some very deep compassionate psychiatrists also, by the way. So I'm really hoping that in my journey through life, I will encounter many of them. And maybe we'll look, at for, we'll look for wider solutions for society and helping people exit medication via other means. And I'm sure Dr. Sen is one of those. So um, the thing is that that recognition by a professional, like I remember 
when I used to go to the psychiatrist and I could have this dialogue with him where, where we could talk as two adults and, and two human beings who understood each other, he got me. Like, okay, he got it. I'm in suffering and he gets it. My mom doesn't get it. My, my dad doesn't understand. My sister is fighting with me, suppose, but she was in the US studying, so she was not fighting exactly. But that is how it is. So we seek that legitimation, legitimacy that my suffering is, is meaningful, it's valid, and somebody recognizes it. So that is what the recognition is, and that is what matters. But Aparna, if you've read the book, and I think you have, towards the end of the book, I have written something called Recognition, Care or Coloniality. So is the care, or, or is the recognition by the professional, the doctor, really helping the person, or is it just making them enter the patient's role with no exit? no exiting the patient's role. And that is where I come to the idea of coloniality. So care, so you, we, we feel that my doctor cares a lot about me, he's so kind, he understands me, he gets me completely. And then there is this relationship where I keep going back to the doctor and seeking his or her approval for every little thing in my life. Dr. Saab, uh, can I take up a job now? Should I get married? Can I have children? Can I do this? For, can I do that? So it, it is as though my mind and my body has become the territory of psychiatry to govern. Now I come to the colonial relationship. We all, we have been a colonized people in India, so we understand the meaning of the colonial master. What happens when a colonizer comes into a colony? Uh, the first thing that happens is they look at the, the people that they're about to colonize and they say that, look, you are a useless people, you have no knowledge about anything, you're duffers, your education is poor, you have no, you're barbarians, your knowledge is all backward, you have no idea about what you're talking. So I am going to give you a more superior way of looking at yourself, whether, by, I'm, I'm talking exactly about the British, by the way, that's what they did in India and we all know that. So I am going to give you a superior way of understanding yourself via which you will be able to now look at your own problem in a better way and you will be able to deal with it via science. Now science, because psychiatry is of course a discipline of medicine, so it seems like, yeah, it is very much a scientific discipline. It is, it is talking science, it is talking in our favor and we believe that psychiatrist has the answer to my, my, my suffering, which is actually uh, which may be my exam problem, or it may be how my teacher behaves with me. I mean, I don't know if how many of you saw that newspaper thing today in the morning, that uh, Muslim child, uh, that the, where the teacher is saying that hit every buddy should go and hit that child in the class, and there's a video made out of that in a, in a UP school, and it is so shocking, my God, I, I, I was so shaken in that, in that thing, um, and I said, oh my God, is that really a teacher? I mean, what kind of a teacher is that? So, and then there was a, somebody sent me a video also of the same later, and I said, oh, no, no, this is not something I can watch. And this, another case recently which happened in Gurgaon, this is a girl who had married a boy of her own village, and uh, the girl's family comes over to her house, and, and they choke her, they, they, they kill her. So where we are living in a society which is actually very, very violent, where violence against the individual is normalized, and we are, we are living like that. We accept it as a part of living. I mean, I can't understand, I can't imagine that child's mental state or that girl who, just because she loved somebody, she's killed like that by her own brother, mother, father, whatever. So, and then the, the village headman says that that is the right way, that is how we have to manage these young people in our society because they don't know what the norms are and this is, this is how it has to be. So she was not living in the village, by the way. She was li living in Gurgaon with her, uh, with her husband and, and they come to her house to do that, commit that crime. So, so we are living in, in, in that kind of a world, you know, where violence is endemic. It is, we are sitting in violence, actually, in our homes where violence is a day-to-day -day thing. It's not really happening outside against somebody else. It's happening against us. And it is this violence which is oppressing us on a day-to-day -day basis, and we are seeking help from this violence via some means which we think has a solution, which often we think is psychiatry when it comes to mental health issues. If you look at the children nowadays, if you look at anybody young going to school, college, or anywhere, how oppressed, 
how sad everybody how sad how heartbroken i mean i say where is the ch where are the joyful faces i think the the really joyful children are those whose home scenarios are really bad and then the school is less oppressive for them so they are the ones who are really happy to go to school otherwise all children are quite miserable going to school where children uh, where teachers are always demeaning them undermining them i mean we really have to do some a whole lot of i think uh, I don't know what, a societal overhaul perhaps. So um, I, I think I've veered somewhere away. Um, so pr please bring me back <laughs> for now. <laughs> we were talking about coloniality. Yeah, so coming back to coloniality. So when psychiatry steps in and says that I have a solution for your exam failure, the fact that you cannot sleep now, or you are not able to uh, maybe uh, you know study well or focus or attention or anything, we say, yeah this man is talking science now. And it also has a term for it. It's called bipolar disorder. It's called ADHD. It's called something, whatever it's called. We never, and nobody has the time, professionals of course don't have the time to get to the bottom of the problem, to see where the problem is coming from, whether it's their, how their parents are behaving with their home. So that acceptance of the colonial, uh, of, of the interpretation, so where the lay narrative, I go with my narrative of suffering, and now it is, given back to me in the form of a scientific discourse, seemingly scientific discourse, which has its own nomenclature, which has its own terms and, and you know all of that. And I'm given that back, so I think, wow, this is science, yeah. This man knows the truth. This woman knows her job, you know. So I must believe what she has to say because they really have the answer for my problem. And this is how people enter into the colonial relation with psychiatry. See, my work or my, 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 my thinking is not against individuals. It is against an institution which is so uh, powerful. And why is psychiatry powerful now? Because it is backed by the pharma corporations. And pharma corporations are very interested that people should take medicines because it helps. It helps if 10% of Indians are just taking antidepressants, just 10%. That's a huge amount of money for them. So anyway, there is a lot of politics also over here, but we cannot get into all the details of uh, pharma corporations. But the coloniality is when I not only believe what the doctor is saying, but I also change my language and I start speaking the same language as the doctor. You know, I'm a bipolar. I have all these symptoms, you don't know. I have all this dysmorphia and this and that and all kinds of languages because people are now reading on the internet everything. So they know all the language very well. It's a lot of language game. So part of my work has been in language and, and sort of uh, deconstruction of language and seeing how language is playing a powerful and a, the game of power as it played out through language. So seeing that, is, is something which we see the colonial relation when I, I, undermine, I, I undermine you and I say you're stupid because I know better. And you may not say that I'm stupid, you might say, but you know, uh, this is the latest DSM. I'm saying, wow, what is the DSM saying? So there's a big book out there in America, the American Psychiatric Association has written. So when the professional comes with their seemingly authoritative claim that, because psychiatry is a huge institution. It's not just one psychiatrist sitting in a room and by himself alone without any attachments to the world. They are backed by huge pharmaceutical corporations. They have a huge, I mean, psychiatry is a very organized institution if, if we, we understand that. And when the institution itself is organized, it's going to throw its weight behind every single doctor. So we think the man of science is the man who's going to help me. We think science is there because it is there with the solution. Science also dropped some atom bombs on people. That was also science. Yeah? There were people who, who, who murdered people in the name of all kinds of eugenics and whatnot. So that was also science. So we have to see uh, what is the science that we are talking about over here. Is the doctor, just because he has a certain degree and a certain ability, to look at somebody's behavior. They're not doing any scientific experiment or some kind of a, a bio uh, sort of analysis of any of your blood samples or anything to say that, okay, you have this problem. No, they just listen to you. They're looking at your behaviors externally. And based on that, they give you a description that this four symptoms now reconfigure you into a patient. When you went in, you were just a person. 
but of course that of course happens with all uh, sort of suffering but this thing is something which is which is very shocking because that is a recognition that recognition gives us legitimacy at the same time we have to think whether it really helps us in the long run so uh, some of you or uh, some of you maybe may, may, may know of people who have been to psychiatrists or who have been through the mental health system we really seek that you know, I was a very, very compliant patient for 18 years. I mean, I'm, I was so compliant that I would not miss a, a dose, and that, that kind of compliant. And, I, and in fact, I remember there was a doctor in the Ames who, who told me once, why don't you stop the medicine? I said, I think he doesn't know how serious bipolar is. I think he's crazy. He wants to experiment on me or something. He doesn't know how serious bipolar is. Because I was so convinced that bipolar is something which you have to take medication for. If you don't take, you, the whole uh, psychosis will come back. So, but anyway, the psychotic episodes happened nevertheless. And I have done it all, including having police cases against me and hit people and this and that and you name it. So I have been... I've. I've seen the whole spectrum of psychosis as could have been seen by anybody. So I'm saying that this, uh, this whole relationship is a very complex relationship and whether it's the, the, coming to that care or coloniality, whether psychiatric care is really care. And that is what I want to illustrate with Vindhya's story. Uh, 35, maybe how many years? From 15 to 50 is about 35 years? Yeah. So 35 years of taking medicine, and today morning I get this information. She says I have a dementia diagnosis now. So did that medication help her? There was nothing, and there's so much I've written about, about that one story. I would really urge the ones who have read, uh, who have seen the book, to read that particular thing, in particular, you know. If you can talk a little about, you know, after having been, as you say in your own words, a compliant patient for 18 years, what was that point when you decided that this is it? I need some other route. This is not working for me anymore. There is no such point, Aparna, honestly, because uh, a compliant patient is basically a very disciplined person because they have a lot of faith in uh, psychiatry and they believe it has the answers. So uh, I was not looking for an answer, um, for a way out. It was my sister. She's sitting right there. And uh, it's her painting, which is also on the, the book cover. Uh, she was uh, in Calcutta and she was looking out for a homeopath and she told me that uh, look uh, uh, why don't you try out this homeopath I said oh, yeah, shut up you just I'm very stable forget it I'm very very stable on this medication I have my perfect dose I am very well fitted with this dose I don't want to touch anything you just do your own thing whatever you have to do you do your treatments she had some other issues and uh, most patients are like that they are they're so comfortable in that in that particular format you know that they don't. So my mom said that, look, you, you, I suggest you please go to Calcutta and uh, whatever it takes, you just get that medicine. So I said, okay, I went. Uh, just for a lark, I went. And there was no intention that I'm going to, but when I went and I saw, met this elderly person and I was, I said, wow, he really is talking something which, and, uh, which is uh, worthwhile and I must listen. So I think uh, the patient role actually makes you very, very, stable you know so there is a stability narrative where we want we all want that oh my god i want just want that i should be able to continue my life the way it is with this stability i don't want to upset this apple cart in any way reducing the dose changing the doses nobody wants that so we just want to remain i didn't actually and this is where i think the uh, the caregiver plays a very important role aparna because that person who is on medication does not want to upset their apple cart in any way. You know, they are very happy and they have accomplished and reached a certain level of stability. It is somebody else who is watching them if they have that somebody. That's why Vindhya, when she does not have anybody, she has a story where her mother, who was her caregiver, died. Her brother committed suicide. She was divorced by, by the person that she married because of her schizophrenia diagnosis. She was an engineer by training. She was not an uneducated woman. Uh, was new, she is, but uh, there is nobody around. And no matter what I say, sitting here where I am, far away, um, we are always on the phone only, she will not pay heed to me if I say that, please don't take that medication. It's only one medicine that she takes, which I've written about over here. But that is enough to progressively disable her the way she's going on that, down that path of dementia now. So this is what, uh, so patients will, we, because we have so much faith in our doctors, we really think that they know the best. 
I mean, that's true for all patients. All patients. We really think the doctors know. And I don't think unless there is some, uh, somebody who is going to get us out of that inertia, whether by listening to a talk or a book or something, like my mom also said, you just try this thing. I'll give you the, medicine, the money for the, the air ticket. You just go. 12,000 the air ticket was. And my doctor Sahib gave me medicine, which cost me 1,200 rupees for three months. I came back with that medicine. 2010, I stopped psychiatric medication, and that's it. Of course, it was, uh, there was a lot of, uh, I would say, the withdrawal and all of that happened. But uh, that is something which I now help other people do because I understood the process very well. Right. Um, I'm, I'm uh, intrigued by your uh, conversation around homeopathy. You know, a lot of times homeopathy is sort of dismissed. You know, it's, it's called just a placebo and so on and so forth. Um, do you, did you have any sort of uh, apprehensions going in? Um, with homeopathy, was that something, a system that you sort of believed in at all or did you just say, okay, let me just, I mean, because it's a very difficult decision, right? When you've believed in your diagnosis, you've believed in your medicines, to just give that up and to start with something like homeopathy, which, you know, unless you've had your own experience with it and it's worked. In fact, you. Aparna, I've also written about this, I think, you, I don't know if you've seen yeah, that yeah, appendix, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. There's a full appendix uh, devoted to homeopathy because uh, I was raised in a homeopathy-believing family. So my father was a practitioner, even though he was a college teacher, but he did homeopathy on the side. My grandfather, my, on my mother's side, was also into practicing homeopathy for himself. So we were, like, technically in that sense, homeopathic loving family. <laughs> even our dogs were treated with homeopathy. But um, we also have, I would say, a little, or relatively, as opposed to a lot of people, a lot of cognitive flexibility. We are not just looking at homeopathy, we are looking at all disciplines, all kinds of medical plural, uh, plural, plural, plurality which is existence. We are into everything, our family. So we are very cognitively flexible. We, if, if there is, somebody tells me that you eat this thing, this jadi booty or something, I don't mind trying it out. I mean, even if I have to grow it in my house, I'll do that. And I will do all kinds of things because ultimately it's about reclaiming my health. So, uh, but by the way, my, I never tried homeopathy with my own father because uh, he never believed that he could do it, you know. So when this option and this other homeopath came on the horizon and my, my sister said, why don't you try this thing out? So that's when we tried. So all these 18 years, though my dad was sitting at home, he never tried it on me. Or he never said that, why don't you take the homeopathic path? No, we never did. Mm -hmm. And I was absolutely against homeopathy, by the way. So I said, no, 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 it's not going to work. But when my sister said, no, no, no. So because the, uh, okay, I've also written about how siblings play a role, you know, for people. So if you have siblings that you trust, like I trusted my sister that if she's telling me something, uh, maybe she, uh, she, of course she means my, my best interest in that sense, you know. There, are, there can be siblings who are quarreling between them a lot. So I have written, in fact, a whole uh, passage or a whole section where, how siblings play a role of support to the person who is given the diagnosis and how, what kind of a positive role they can play. I've also, played, I've also written about indifferent siblings mm -hmm. or siblings who are don't care only. You know, they're absolutely not bothered. So siblings play different kinds of roles and those roles I've mapped in, in all these stories also. So that's how it is, you know. All right. um, Pratisha, you've also written about the importance of agency. Right, and and that really, in a way, becomes the defining, um, uh, you know, sort of quality, uh, which which determines which way, uh, you know, a, a journey will go. Now the question is, how do you build agency? You know, so in in some of the stories you've spoken, for instance, um, Akshay, I think, who's you know, who's somebody with a lot of agency from the word go. Yeah. You know, he doesn't enter the system at all. Oh, he yeah, enters, but very briefly. Very yeah, yeah, when yeah, his friends brief. sort yeah, of yeah, yeah. Push put him, pressure yeah, yeah, yeah. on him and so on and so forth. Um, where does this agency come from and how can we uh, build this sense of agency in more and more people? Aparna, I don't think somebody can build agency in anybody. I'll tell you that. Because agency is built when you understand that your self is wounded. You know, when the self is so decimated and the self is hurt or wounded or, or damaged in, this, in the course of a lifetime. Mm. It doesn't happen in a day. You can't really build agency. That, okay, it's my agenda to build somebody's agency. When you start supporting their self 
in, in affirmative ways and you say, yeah, okay, you want to do music? You go ahead, do music. You want to do painting? You go ahead, do painting. You want to work with dogs? By all means, do that. You want to do something else? Or you don't want to study? Okay, no problem. Let's not study today. Or let's study little, little bit, okay? Not so much. So when you start accepting their reality as, as a valid reality, as a truth which is worthy of consideration and inclusion, mm. that the self which has been wounded, you know, mm. it starts, okay, I'm right then. I, I can be right, you know, I, I don't have to study all the time, right? But if you say, no, you can't. I mean, particularly if you see that story that, I think Bharti, that girl, no? Mm. That's, that girl whose mother is teaching the same university right, as right, you. Right, 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 right. So this is a very, another kind of a story in which the girl, she again, is, gets a diagnosis of schizophrenia at the same age, about 15 or 16. And the time I'm meeting her, she's 22. And then uh, how her mother, in her, may I say the word, over-concern, parental over-concern, she is like a mother hen who does not let her child come out from under, under her wings at all for anything. So she says, uh, my child must go to the university with me, to the same university as me. So she's a senior professor in some other department, but the girl must go to where the mother is, the same university. She should not go alone by bus because you never know. Mm -hmm. uh, she's a simple girl. There might be rapists over there. Mm -hmm. She has to be escorted for every little thing. So that over-concern where, where she cannot have friends over and, the, I, I, and she absolutely becomes lonely in her life. Mm -hmm. There's not a single person outside of her family that she can talk to. And the girl just keeps on getting more and more degrees. So when I started, she was doing one master's degree and then she goes into another master's degree instead of taking up a job where she wanted to, but mother says no. And so that if you see where the child, I mean, the child is unfortunately made to remain a child, you know, in that infantile kind of a situation where you are reduced, you know, that whole thing about beti bachao, mm -hmm. that, that whole thing that you have to save the girl, that, that infantilism. That woman has to be saved, the child has to be saved. No, I have to show my child the, the best option in life, as if you know the best option. Mm. As if you have all the answers, you know, for everything. You lived in a different world when you were growing up and your child is in a different world altogether. But to have this belief that I know better, I have the answers. That is, I think, the real problem actually, which we have to learn to question our own behaviors and our own choices also and have some doubt about ourselves. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this whole thing about agency, Aparna, is very, very complex indeed. It, it, it takes a long, long time and it cannot be an imposition. Yeah. It cannot be fostered. Mm -hmm. It can only be supported by saying, yes, what you're saying, let's do that. Mm -hmm. You know, let's try this thing. Like, I'll just tell you one little example. A boy recently came to me and he said, oh my God, and he's a, he's a son of, uh, in a family where they are, four children and he's the youngest. And he says that um, I have to study science only, you know, because I don't think that I can do anything else. I mean, he doesn't want to. He says, I only want to play chess if I can. So I said, why don't you think of uh, maybe having a chess academy of your own? I said, really? I said, yeah, I saw in Goa that people, ha they have houses of their own, they, they, they rent a flat and, and they're running some chess academies and I see lots of uh, footwear outside, the children are going and playing chess one, one batch after the other. So he said, wow, this is also an option. So I said, think of that like, like, as a career option. <laughs> but he's saying, I'm playing chess on the phone. I said, no, beta, at least get up and start playing the real chess. Now, what it will take to play the real chess and the, the physical effort, but he's too lazy. So, in a way, he will fall in that same circle, but at least the option now appears in his mind that that is also a viable thing I can think of to actually have a career in chess. Whether, whether he's going to go the entire length is, of course, a different call. But I'm saying that uh, this whole issue about <clears throat> whether or not uh, the child can think for himself or not, you know, this becomes... Uh, and, and one could argue that the point at which you're seeking help, you know, the reason you're seeking help is because you don't have the answers or you don't have the ability at that point to really do what you really want to do, right? Yes. And that is exactly why there is a breakdown in the psyche. Yes. 
and what you want to do is not acceptable to others also yeah. you know yeah. so so you will end up doing more importantly even yeah. to yourself even to yourself you have also. internalized it so much yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Right. you reject what is the natural flowering like uh, of your mind and you say no but i must study science only because that is the right thing whether i whether i want to do music doesn't matter because i'll do it later on i'll i'll do some dance once later on you know i know one person who <clears throat> who's a medical doctor by the way and he has a voice which is completely choked and he says i wanted to be um, a singer and i come from a family where it was my father said you bloody well if you think of singing i'm going to straighten you out so he went into medicine to become a doctor but you know the the, the throat chakra the fact that his expression was choked for life now he's of course uh, he's a very senior age now but the point is that when the self is denied and i'm not saying mine was not and therefore i had the bipolar of course mine was also therefore i landed there also you know but i had to understand that this is what is happening this has happened to me and i have to rebuild myself so that process is still on you know and and uh, so this is the whole thing that uh, i think you get my point right yeah. mm. great i think i'm going to open it up for questions because i can see some hands raised already um Yes, absolutely. In fact, I think uh, I think the bane of society is competition. The fact is that everybody should just do everything. Children should play, they should have enough sporting fields, they should have enough uh, places to learn music, to do dance, to do whatever they want to do, whatever makes their expression come alive. Children need to do that. Children are adults, not even children. Everybody needs to do that. Because if I think if if everybody is singing, for, for instance, I of course I'm an advocate for music, but that doesn't mean that <laughs> I don't advocate for everything else also. If people are singing, will they not be happy? I think the musicians have done a lot of damage in society because they have made everybody into a kansen. They want people to hear the music. They don't want to sing. They don't want others to sing because then who will listen to them? I really think so. And we really have to question the practices we have in music where where majority of people are trained just to listen to other people and not really bring out their own exp- because we are basically born in music. We we must let that music flow because until the music flows unless it we express us I'm not saying this. So music is just a metaphor for expression, for voice. the voice doesn't mean it has to be a musical voice only it is the 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 gift that we have come with when you are able to express the capacity for the gift that you're carrying into the world and you are the gift actually but but if you are stifled that that gift is choked then you are you take another path of resistance of of tantrums of all kinds of you know aggression then which which of course then again the violence meets violence of psychiatry and and the circle, the circle perpetuates so i think this whole uh, competitive sport competitive music is all rubbish nobody needs any competition we just need expression we just birds are not competing with each other flowers are not competing look at nature if there's a competition it's only for survival there is no need for this kind of an artifice where somebody who's the best should be judged for that everybody needs to have facilitation so that whatever their voice is it can be nurtured and it can be fostered into a good kind of a singing voice for themselves and let's see what comes out of it later that's actually such a difficult idea right because it is a difficult society idea. is based on competition how much money do you have my idea is a little car? odd aparna my idea is <laughs> like that how big is your house and and the competition it divides people that's how social control works because it divides people and we are uh, you know that questions our sense of self worth then uh, isolates us all that right so, but slightly moving away from that i was also thinking about you know how we talked about psychiatry and definitely psychiatry huge damage you know <laughs> yeah except him of course <laughs> so but um, what I'm concerned about I'm coming as a therapist as somebody who works in this this whole mental health industry that has kind of mushroomed in the past few years it's alarming 
It's alarming because mental health practitioners, therapists, counselors, all of us are complicit in reproducing this dominant discourse. You know, when the parents are bringing children to us, I work with children, young people, it's about padhai nahi kar hai, bahut gussa karta hai, ya he, he should be doing science but he wants to play chess, please fix him. And we are all complicit in our work is to do what the society is telling what's the right thing to do. Right? So that is something that is very alarming because this whole idea and the way this self-surveillance has become so, so intense and complex with the, the role social media plays, you know, the, for the young women, particularly I get very concerned about young women and where every young girl I meet is concerned, you know, this idea that standards of beauty and worth and success, I could go on, but you know, this this whole, if, you Body know, image. rather than just psychiatry, yeah. I think we should look at the whole mental health Absolutely. industry and the damage it's Absolutely. doing to, yeah. Yeah. to our society and to our young people particularly. Yes. The world right now is based on the idea there is something lacking in you which you need to do and make yourself better or more socially acceptable, whether it's your skin color, or it's your body shape, or it's something else about you, because there's fundamentally some problem which you need to rectify to become more acceptable in society. Even if it's eating potato chips, yeah, uh, how is your sari better than mine, or my vi less white or more white, or whatever it is. Everything is a discourse of deficit. It's all based on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dr. Shaman, you just uh, talked about how the legitimacy that recognition provides. And along that, we also talk about the colonial power of psychiatric language. So then does uh, self-diagnosing oneself provide a better route to achieving both recognition while also not becoming a subject? And uh, is ostensibly also, age, like, provides agency as well? No, in fact, you know, this whole proliferation of this discourse on the internet, thanks to millions of American websites talking about, you know, the same diagnosis, you can self-diagnose if you're having these many symptoms, this is the diagnosis. So this, in fact, you know, there's a whole field of inquiry which is called medical rhetoric. If you look at that field, they will tell you how people have actually started looking for their own diagnosis, and it seems, in, I was reading in one of these journals, and I've also cited in this book, it says that people actually decide their diagnosis just by those self-questioning, uh, you know, questionnaires on WebMD and all that, and then they just go to the psychiatrist for confirmation. Came with bipolar hai na, so they just so no ki I'm go I have all these symptoms. So in fact, people used to ask me earlier, I'm having all these symptoms. I'm I'm sure I'm bipolar. I said, please don't think it is such a wonderful thing that you feel like having it. So this whole problem is a very uh, so this whole it, it is actually that recognition that you are seeking. And you're finding it on, you know, people finding it on the online, and that has actually, it's, it's not about agency, actually. What happens there is uh, you're just wanting that recognition that my suffering is understood by somebody, you know, and that is all that you require, that legitimacy. And in 99 cases out of 100, there is some role the family is playing, everybody's fa family, including my own. So whether I can go back to my family and start solving those problems. It may not be immediately, it may not be, I cannot go say address my dad and say, okay, you are the patriarch and you've, you've messed up my life. You know, you, you, nobody can do that. But at least you can get together in a group of people and start looking at some problems and externalizing those problems rather than saying, okay, it's, it's my biological problem and I just have pop a pill for that, you know? You have to learn to see that I'm a popping a pill because my dad has been uh, violent towards my mother or something else, you know, and that has caused a lot of tremendous grief and suffering in me and it has silenced my voice. But what do I do next after this? Does the diagnosis help me? Does it empower me to deal with the situation that I'm faced with in my life? Or if it's, if it's just to numb your senses so that you can, okay, shut your ear, go to sleep. If that is the way, then that is also the way then, you know, yeah. They're on medication, they aren't themselves. And, you know, you are truly engaging with somebody who is a person, a different person, right? Yeah. So you're not uh, therapeutizing or you're not rehabilitating an individual who actually needs to acknowledge the suffering that he's gone through. So um, to, to come to the specifics and to really ask my question is that, um, do you think that, you know, uh, the DSM and the ICDs and all the psychologists that the research have done, 
people believe that psychosis has its roots in biology and genetics and that it's all of that and not suffering and uh, when you talked about you know the chakra the throat chakra being suppressed and emotional reasons being there and then there are always you know stories the uh, uh, individuals who have this disability talk you know they always have some bit of truth in it and if you look at the case histories written and if you listen to their stories about uh, you know when they talk about the psychosis it always seems that there's a grain of truth and then there's a bit of a delusion in it so uh, you know when you talk about that there is an alternative it really uh, you know sparks a good debate and uh, i would like to ask is there a truth or is there a grain of truth is there a root cause besides biology is psychosis more than you know just a pass or by hereditary or bad uh, genetics and can we do something about I, it? I think uh, that would take a longer exposition and discussion and perhaps research, which I'm also going to indulge in at some point because I want to work in psychosis more so. But yes, alternatives are there. Not only me, I mean, scores of people recover all over the world. I have given a lot of evidence in the book. And I know personally so many people across the globe, not just in India, also in India who have recovered from psychosis, from bipolar and schizophrenia. So it's not just uh, me who's, uh, or some handful of these 10 odd people. Uh, so all of these 10 people, in fact, uh, Roma had the last year, uh, this year, Ron, this year, a seminar issue? Last year. Last year. Last year. Last year, Roma did a uh, seminar issue on mental health and in which I wrote that I, I did my study with 10 people. And when I began the study, three people were fully recovered people just like me and there were seven people on medication, you know. But by the time I finished my PhD, uh, it had reversed. So there were three people who were very stable in the patient role and seven people were now out of medication. So which means those seven and uh, they had, uh, please uh, read that seminar issue, it's available on seminar uh, February 2022, isn't it? Uh, no, no, no. February 22, or 23? 23. 23, it's February 23, sorry, this year only. Seminar issue, I've written about this, that how people actually, once they met me, and I've written in chapter three also, how the peers met me and how they interviewed me. When I went to people's, uh, to meet them and talk to them about their stories, because they were all peers, they asked me, how did you recover? Because nobody has met people who have recovered from, from bipolar or schizophrenia. At least not they're walking in the streets or they're not meeting you in their homes. So, and so I had, I, whatever I knew about my own recovery, I shared everything very openly, very honestly. And I said, I don't know the way yet, but maybe today I do, but at that point I didn't. And I shared whatever I knew and the roles, I mean, the whole numbers changed. They took over their lives, they decided. So I, I mapped that in Roma's art uh, and th that thing. And coming back to your question, doctor, I think, um, see, we all carry the capacity for cancer and diabetes and equally psychosis. So whether the epigenetics is going to trigger off is going to be determined by the, uh, by the environment. What, what is the environment giving you? you know, so that environment which triggers off your uh, psychotic behavior or it sort of brings a meltdown, if you can understand that, uh, if we can sort of do something about it, because that's why we have to look at not just the individual but also the environment. And there are many alternatives at present also, including uh, Dr. Shelja has just said about she's doing work in narratives. There is the open dialogue approach, which originated in, in, in Finland. Uh, there is uh, so much else going on. There's collaborative therapies. There's somebody who's just spoken with me about horses and they're working in the US with that. I work as a peer therapist. I do uh, work with people having psychosis and also then, the point is, what can we do at the moment of the psychosis? I think for, for the psychotic phase, maybe it's, it's, and it need not be a very long phase at times. It, we can just give a small medicine and then withdraw the person from the medicine because the rehabilitation must happen. But when you say that, uh, you, you, you be in medicine for life now, for, for instance, Vindhya's story. Yeah, that's not right. So even, even ethically, giving antipsychotic to somebody for 30 years is just not permissible, even by psychiatric standards, but that is happening. That is happening, and that is the trouble, because it brings so many comorbid conditions. It brings all kinds of iatrogenic injuries. Dr. Sen, please. You were good at that.
and in these 35 years, um, the way psychiatry has been practiced or looked at has changed over a period of time. And also, there are spaces across the world where it's seen in very different light. So while I completely uh, uh, agree with you, well, and thank you for bringing this to uh, uh, this, this uh, forum, that it is indeed a, a big institution which is driven sometimes by forces which probably do not have um, the right intentions. They have very vested interests. And, and that's important to hold on to. But the other big thing, I think, is that which we need to understand is not to take some of this science and the research behind it too seriously. Yes, yes, because absolutely. Actually, if you look at it, yeah. Yeah. Usually, yeah. the science is, Sketchy. if I can call it, fickle. Uh, it's, it's not really Specious. robust in any sense. <laughs> no. because, and that's why it keeps changing. Yeah. So, um, why are there a f uh, uh, why are there why is there now a DSM five? Yes, why has it, absolutely. Why has it kept changing? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. when I was doing my MD about thirty five years ago, uh, there was DSM three. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And after that, DSM four came. Then it became DSM four revised. Mm. Now there's DSM five, and it changes mm. because the views about mental illness and the science behind it keeps changing. Yes. So in that sense, it's very dynamic, and our understanding of it is also very dynamic and to set it in stone and say that you know what if you have psychosis you must have the gene and you're carrying it and there is no way out and not to consider what's happening in the rest of the world around you the environment your family your upbringing and the social political climate that you live in absolutely you know, that just imagine and it's such a disservice not to acknowledge, acknowledge that, that and, yes and not to take it holistically i actually believe that psychiatrists have done themselves a lot, a lot of disservice by taking a very polarized view, saying that we know everything, yeah. and you come to us with, and we with the solution, that. yeah, it's, it's so far from the truth, hmm. you know. And I think that as a collective, we need to acknowledge that, and we need to say that there is much more to mental health or ill health than just a gene, just a, a cluster of symptoms, a cookbook approach where you get into the net or you go to a psychiatrist and they'll tick boxes and say, "Oh, you qualify for this. Here's the pill, and you'll get sorted." It's it's such a uh, narrow understanding of human existence, the human mind, and life. I'm so grateful to hear such a psychiatrist, really. Yes. Yes. <laughs> really. And I'd just like to add that even with psychosis, you know, there are some very interesting approaches across the world. There's the Hearing Voices Network. Uh, there's some a wonderful work that's been done by British psychologists, uh, led by Mary Boyle, Dr. Mary Boyle. Uh, she's written this book, which for me was my Bible when I was making a film on schizophrenia, which is Schizophrenia, Scientific Delusion. You know, where they're really talking about, in a way, neurodivergence many years before the term became so popular, right? And, and this whole thing of, you know, I'm feeling this and I need to do this, you know. And, and why is the term neurodivergent becoming so popular right now? Because I mean, there's, there's some great neuroscience saying that we're all neurodivergent. Who is that neurotypical, <laughs> mythical neurotypical person, you know? <laughs> Who is that person, you know? We are all equally neurodivergent. Yeah, yeah. go on. Um, yeah, so I wanted to sort of um, combine two things that you touched upon. One was the uh, Gurugram incident with the violence that, you know, family members were committing against another family member and the whole role of agency that you spoke of. So I remember being at a disability seminar where they mentioned that, you know, frequently with disabled people, there's very little control that they have over their lives and there's a lot that's decided by the family for them. Like you were saying, Dr. Jeeva, I can marry, you know, can I have a job and all of that not being done. So so I just wanted to ask your thoughts on what sort of um, institutional safeguards must exist to, you know, protect the agency of the patient, not just from the, maybe the medical professionals, but from their own family themselves. It has to be negotiated by everybody personally with their own family or bring the family on the table and discuss it. I'm sure many of us are doing that. I'm sure you're doing that. I'm, I'm, I'm sure I'm doing that. I'm sure many people who are working with families are doing that because there can be no overarching institutional, you know, watchdog like that. And when, when because it is, it is so normalized, it is so acceptable that this girl should have been killed because she has married a boy against the wishes of the larger Biradri the cup and chat or whatever it is. It's just unthinkable. It's like he's a brother because he lived in the same village. You know, so I don't think uh, uh, we are, we, we basically, we don't have the idea of the individual as their own person. We think the individual belongs to the collective and must be governed by certain laws which the collective has decided for them, for life, for, for the rest of, I mean, for all times to come. 
and there is no individual here. The self is of course not there. So this whole, and of course it's, it's the male uh, you know, mindset which is gonna govern everybody and that's what is happening here. So the patriarchy is, is overarching over everything. And of course we know the kappan chats are all uh, like hyper-masculine, everything is, is like that, no? Yeah. Semiotics is a field that talks about what uh, real world objects, for instance, say, signifies to the person. And here is where plurality can come into the picture. Like, if anyone is familiar with John Berger, ways of seeing, he's, he had a whole series about this. So, I think it's really interesting and I want to know what your thoughts on this are. Like, uh, ontologically speaking, you've written in your book that it's not really certain. And that's what Wittgenstein also says, right, in his linguistics text, that it's not certain what a person could be talking about at a, a different, like, at a certain point of time, philosophically speaking. And psychology as a field has roots linguistically in philosophy, right? Because yeah. suffering, grief, all of these, the concept of self itself, hmm. these are concepts like thinkers like Aristotle, Kierkegaard, and all have come up with. So I think it's, uh, I mean, I just wanted to ask if uh, you think, like, mind is an organ which forms its, like, you know. Is mind an organ? Is yeah. mind there in the body? The anyway? brain is an organ, yeah, is what yeah, I meant, yeah, is, yeah. which forms the concept of self through thinking. And hmm. philosophy and language have their roots, uh, form the roots of psych psychology. Right. So here is where, I mean, I think we're looking at a very radical uh, formation with the understanding that you've given us. So I'm thankful for that. Thank you so <laughs> and, much. I mean, I just wanted to know what you think about, like, mind forming itself. Uh, the brain forming a, a philosophical component which we really cannot certainly define in lang linguistic terms for psychology. But Vita, just think that is the brain forming itself or is society forming the mind? I mean, just think about that. When we think about alternatives to psychiatric medications or even complementary systems, um, we are looking mostly at verbal therapies or, you know, like we call it therapies and providing uh, DBT or CBT or anything like that, right? So what place do you think arts-based therapies have um, given the history of schizophrenia and shamanism earlier and you being a musicologist yourself? So if you could throw some light on that and do you see a path? I, I think that music has a very viable role to play and not only music but all the arts together because uh, the art is an expression of the individual which is just their own soul's expression to some means that they can communicate through, you know? And I don't think, uh, when, and what is happening in, in, a, in a, some kind of a mental health issue is it's the voice which is stifled. The expression of the person is stifled and it comes out in forms which are, uh, which are unrelatable. People are not able to understand what now they are trying to say because the whole thing has gone so off the, off the center or off something which others can relate with. And if they are able to communicate through the arts, now, I don't know if you uh, are familiar with the, uh, Aparna's work, she made a film about Reshma Valiappan, who's also a co-founder of uh, The Red Door, and how Reshma found her voice through uh, painting, and uh, similarly, I, I used a lot of music for my own recovery, which is documented uh, in journal articles, so it's very easily available online also, uh, and free, so that apart, there are any number of art forms. So basically, the, the issue is communication. It's not just the art forms. It can be through nature. It can be through horses, through dogs, through you name it. It's the soul which seeks to express itself and feel safe somewhere. And when that safety uh, vessel is created via some means, and that expression, it's not just the, uh, these are just conduits, you know, the arts are just conduits. It's basically the fact that the soul needs to express itself in its authentic sense of who I am. Whether you find it through music or art-based therapies, and they're all equally wonderful. And, and, and maybe this is the right time to say that I'm editing another book in which we are writing about so many kinds of uh, things that people are doing for recovery. And of course, there are practitioners who are writing their stories. So, uh, so there will be many alternatives that you will encounter in that book that we are working on. So. I don't know that, Neha, Neha, right? 
Sneha. So um, whose recognition do we need? That is the issue now, you know? Then whether I need uh, so-and-so certification, if I get well, it works for me. And I don't think, uh, so we, we all love the idea of democracy, but democracy is really a very radical idea, you know, that everything is equal. If you see, uh, Aparna asked me a very important question about homeopathy. And we know how homeopathy is uh, demonized, how it's called a placebo or a, a hogwash or nonsense at the very least, you know. So it's boohoo and nonsense and sham and all of that we have heard about homeopathy. If it works for you, it works for you. If plants work for you, something else works for you. But anything can work for you. The point is, whose recognition do you require? And I don't think mainstream, so-called mainstream, which is so organized, you know, they are not going to legitimize anything. If you go to a psychiatrist who's not Dr. Sen, uh, who's going to say, you're going to say, Dr. Sen, I'll give you the medicine. So they'll say, uh, Lekho, I don't know what's going on. And if you eat it, tumhari, it is your responsibility because I don't know what the consequences are going to be. So you can be sure that that little dismissal by the doctor whose approval you're constantly seeking is going to make sure that you will never walk that path. And by the way, uh, you know, I've written extensively about the law in this book. And I've said that there is a thing that, uh, you know, the, there is something called this UNCRPD, which is the Convention of Rights for Persons with Disabilities, and which, uh, which tells you that there should be kind of a plural, plurality of options for people to choose from. So it should not be just that allopathy is the only option or mainstream psychiatric medication. They should have homeopathy, Ayurveda, Yunani, Siddha, everything. All options should be available to people. But who's going to tell you where those options are? So you can just create psychiatric hospitals. You can create a whole noise that we have lack of psychiatrists in this country and we have one psychiatrist per several lakh people, so we need more psychiatric. We need, uh, psychiatrists, we need more psychiatric beds, we need greater infrastructure, we need more uh, central mental health authorities, state mental health authorities, district mental health authorities. We know, we, that is the governance structure which I've written in great detail in this book. And all the possibilities for recovery which could have existed in the social ecosystem, including faith healing, including whatever, they're all demonized and pushed to the corners. So you can be sure that if you try to take any path other than psychiatrist, uh, psychiatry and you want to take anybody's approval, especially a psychiatrist or recognition, that can I take this thing? They'll say, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can do the music therapy as long as it's in my clinic. You can, yeah, we also have an art-based therapist now, nowadays in our, our so I said, wow, this is, <laughs> this is like really co-option. <laughs> so there is no way that you can exit psychiatry because now everybody's in-house in the psychiatric uh, space, you know? Right. And I'd just like to quickly plug our mental health festival, which will be on the 4th and 5th of November this year, where we're getting in uh, experts from Tibetan medicine, homeopathy, uh, and Ayurveda to come and talk about the different ways in which their systems of um, medicine look at what is called mental illness wow. in psychiatry. Thank you. Uh, you ref uh, <coughs> taking a cue from all the discussion which uh, has been there in this forum, uh, I just wanted to say that you uh, observed that uh, we need societal overall. There is a problem of patriarchy now which is affecting negatively the other half of the society. So who is, uh, I mean, going to take uh, the responsibility for the societal overall? And there is society, this term of society is a very amorphous term. So we don't know who this, when we talk of society, who we are talking about. And secondly, uh, like uh, what I feel is that uh, nowadays, like uh, we talk of the uh, all these mental health issues. Now, uh, by default, this problem is going to increase further because actually uh, now we are looking in the uh, living in the technology age. So everything uh, we are being dictated by the technology. So <coughs> technology is evolving very fast, and human evolution is very slow. Mental blocks, uh, that's uh, uh, ment mentality or uh, this thing. Uh, 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 norms are changing, not changing so fast. So uh, that is the disconnect that we, uh, gap or disconnect that uh, by default it is there. And uh, so these issues are going to be there and they are going to increase. So what is the, I mean, uh, who is going to take responsibility for the society when we t say society? Who is this society? Uh, and uh, now it is with technology we are uh, like moving towards individualism, individual freedom, uh, because technology allows that. But society is not like that. Democracy and uh, this thing, 
uh, is not freedom, independence. They are uh, for the community, for the uh, society as a whole, not for the individual. So that is the disconnect. Uh, individualism by t technology is allowing that, but society or the uh, community is not allowing the individual freedom uh, or independence or lib uh, uh, liberty. So that is what is causing these mental health issues and which are going to multiply uh, in future. Because uh, we are living in technology and te we are being dictated by technology and we are not, human beings are not in control. Technology is going to uh, control the human beings, not the other way around, not the vice versa. Thank you. I yes. think society is perhaps you and me. Yeah. Isn't yeah. it? So to change society, I have to change myself. Yeah. Yeah. And the I, if I can change myself, if I can change how I'm relating with people, how whether I'm respectful to the, towards them or I'm just generally dismissive or I'm restless or how I'm driving on, uh, on the road or walking on the road or how I'm dealing with the sabziwala or anybody or anybody who's suffering because everybody is suffering. It's not just people who have mental health issues are they're visibly suffering, they're taking medicine. But even the woman who comes to do the dishes in your home may be suffering deeply, you know? Are we aware of that? I mean, how much of suffering are we aware of except for our own? That is what society has to look at. I don't think we can go and change anybody outside. We really have to take responsibility for ourselves and constantly look at ourselves. That if I, can, I, can I just be a little more patient with this person? Let me not say the word kinder, because I don't know what that kindness would mean for that person. I mean, I can say, okay, I'm being very kind to you, but I don't know whether it's really kind. It can be just my own imagination or my, my foolishness, you know, that my egoistic assumption that this is kindness. So we just have to see how would I be if, if you know, this per I were this person and I had to hear this, something else. So I think we, we can only take responsibility for ourselves to slow down, to put ourselves in different, different scenarios and be more, more patient with others. I don't even, I don't want to use the word compassionate because it's also a very overused kind of a word, you know, just patient to, to see who the other person is, where they're coming from. And perhaps, uh, as far as freedom is concerned, I don't think anybody is free with technology. We are more bound and we are more slave enslaved by technology, actually. We don't have, I don't think a majority of us would, would, would think of leaving their phones behind and, and going out for a walk even. Yeah, but at the same time, that is what, uh, why we are slaves, so like uh, why we are not so are having So are we free with technology or are we uh, free or are we enslaved by technology? That is the question which you have to ask. Yeah, we t always talk of the choice. We have the freedom of choice. We don't have the freedom, actually. We don't have the choice also. We are made to believe as though we have the choice. We don't have a choice. We have a ch if you have the choice, you will dare to walk alone. That is the choice you have, if at all so. You yeah, know? That, is, that, is, uh, that is my point. Uh, exactly. You are correct that you will be alone and you will be isolated. No, so no whether, is you, whether you see that as isolated or you say that I, I'd rather be alone and follow my own heart than be a part of the mob and the, be part of the herd. So that is the only choice you have, if at all. Yeah, that is why many people are choosing to be loners. Uh, yeah, that is correct. Yes. Yeah. Uh, actually, I realize what you are saying, but uh, this uh, awareness or individual, one percent of the people, they realize that the uh, problems we talk about, there are uh, numerous other problems, infinite number, uh, there are problems in the society which are uh, so-called normal people, they are also having mental health issues, but, Absolutely. Uh, but uh, only one percent of the people or very few people, re uh, I mean, realize or uh, they are aware and maybe uh, it's the uh, process is painfully slow. That is what I want yeah, to say. Yeah, but the point Thank is you. that only that person who wants to deal with the problem will solve their problem. No, They can't solve everybody's problem. You might be feeling everybody's having suffering, stress, mental health issues, all kinds of issues. I might be feeling that about everybody also. But only when someone wants to work through their problems and say, I want to solve my problems. I can't solve the problems of the world, but let me solve mine at least, you know. Because even though I, I, I'm, I'm faced with so much of suffering around me, can I just be a little patient with other people? That's all. That's all I can do to myself. Because I don't know whether I, my, my behavior with other person, somebody else is going to aggravate them or make it worse for them, but I can just be patient. At least try to be patient, that's all. To that extent, we are becoming individualistic and we cannot solve the problem at the macro level, at the community level for each and everybody. No, no, so no, 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 I think, if I think of myself, you know, I've worked uh, alone for for, I mean, I really lived alone uh, for 30 years, really. Uh, you won't believe this. You wouldn't have heard me on any forum until now uh, because I have worked alone and individualistically, if you please. But my goal was to do something useful and, and to dive down and get something out for somebody else. I have recovered from psychosis long back. And whatever my suffering, it's, there is no end to it. But 
I'm still able to come over that suffering now and, and still walk through the world peacefully, not so rattled anymore that whatever my life suffering is going to break me down every time. It's not going to. I have developed a certain amount of, uh, I would say, capacity to deal with pain. You know, I can just do it for myself. And if somebody wants to work on themselves, that is the only option they have. That when you calm down, when you come to that point, point of stillness, when you, the world is going to rattle you all the time, but how quickly will you be able to calm yourself down? That is the only thing that we can do. And the more you are calmer, the more you are able to do something for another also. That is what I think. That's what I am trying to thank do. You, thank you. Thank you. Okay, yeah, so, so there is a whole, uh, whole different ways of looking at recovery. Uh, have, have you all heard his question? So he says, what is recovery? So there are many ways of looking at recovery. One recovery, which is called by psychiatrists as recovery, is when somebody is suffering, they come to the psychiatric clinic, their, their suffering is recognized as some kind of a illness, and they start taking medication, and that, the start of the patient role is called as the start of the recovery process. As a patient, I think for me and for all the patients that I have ever encountered, for us, recovery means exiting the patient role, exiting psychiatry, and getting back our life the way we want to. So life is not going to be on a plateau for anybody. It's not going to be easy. Because what you'll have to deal with at what stage you encounter it is going to be pretty difficult. But recovery means when I think that I can take my decisions, suppose I want to learn music, I want to do something else. Whatever it takes to do that thing, it's not going to be easy. But will I have the strength now to stand through that, to walk through that, uh, you know, the whole darkness of the, the pain of going through that process of training myself in music or chess or art or writing a book or whatever else you do? That is the thing. So recovery is when you are able to look at your life, you are able to, of course, ex exit the patient role and you're able to deal with life's ups and downs, the vicissitudes that you have in a little more calm way without having those meltdowns, those psychotic highs and no neurotic behaviors also, you know. You, you're just able to have develop that insight about your life that, yeah, I think I can, I'm suffering, but, but I'm not crumbling, you know. That is recovery. Does that mean like uh, you will develop a very different understanding of your life also? I think so. There has to be a philosophy to life. There is no life without philosophy. I think so. The shift will happen because when we, uh, you know, there's a beautiful book called After the Ecstasy, The Laundry. You know, so if you actually, when you have to, it's Jack Cornfield, After the Ecstasy, The Laundry. You know, the experience of psychosis is an experience of a, some kind of a light experience some kind of an experience that puts you on a high, it makes you go berserk and running helter-skelter. But after that, you require the grounding, the dirty work that you have to do, the hard labor that you have to do, the dishes that you have to wash, and the, and the clothes you have to wash, and the, the exams that you have to write. You know, that, that philosophical shift is the only way. Because what was the life that we were living on a, on, a, on a template, headlessly, without understanding? We are going like everybody else in the rat race, you know? And something has made us get off that rat race. So do I want to go back into that race again? Or do I have to look at life differently? Because I'm not meant for that rat race. And that philosophy is only going to... So, so basically, because this, this, the self is like that, it is seeking more authenticity. So like, this is not me. I'm not doing this thing anymore. That philosophical shift is, of course, there is no other way. I don't think so. Pratiksha, I am a little curious. You came from a family which believed in homeopathy, but you did not. Your sister suggested you and your mother probably supported that and you decided to go to Calcutta, uh, like you said, just for the heck of it. I just want to ask you, what was that factor, what was that motivating factor that inspired you so much that uh, you decided to disturb that apple cart and uh, while you were stable, otherwise you decided to switch over to homeopathy? That's my first question. Once you answer me that, I'll ask okay, you. Okay, sure. 
So the thing was that uh, when I went to Calcutta, that the doctor, he, he interviewed me for at least two hours. He asked me every single thing, including my heartbeat. He checked every little thing about me, my skin, uh, my, my hair, uh, the kind of hair I have. And I said, my God, is this man a doctor or a what? I mean, why is he asking me so many questions, so many questions? What every single, do you feel more cold uh, in the summer or winter or as opposed to somebody else who's there? He said, look, homeopathy is a science of observation. The more you develop observation about something, the more closer you're able to observe the phenomena, the more closer, the more accurate you are to the, uh, the, 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 the answers that you get. So he was very, very uh, gentle, first of all. And then I asked him one thing, that Dr. Saab, I have been on medicine without changing a single, without missing a single dose for 18 years. When do I, I mean, how do we switch over out of medicine now, this particular psychiatric medication? How does the switch happen? Do we do it slowly? Do we taper it down? Do we, like, what is the process going to be? He said, stop it. I said, what? I'm sure by the time I reach Delhi, I'll be in a psychotic, some kind of a meltdown. He says, no way. I'm Mehuna. This, this man has so much of uh, confidence in himself. I mean, he was an elderly person. And uh, I said, I've never met a person like this who says, Ki, you stop the medicine now and you Monday you go back home and then uh, the weekend nothing will happen to you and we'll see after that. So I said, really, really, he really knows something. Either he really knows something or I am up for some kind of a ride. Anyway, so I trusted him. For some reason I did, you know. It's just the instinct. And I've only met two people like that. So he was, uh, one was this Dr. Saab, Dr. Mitra, and one was uh, a yoga teacher who was a very learned person also. And people who can push your boundaries, you know. So I was very fortunate to have those two people in my life. And, uh, you know, three years later, two, three years later, I met him, uh, September, and he says, uh, now you don't need the medicine, you can stop it. I said, how can I stop it? I've, I've, at least from psychiatry, I'm feeling safe in, in, in homeopathy. I don't, I don't think I want to get out of this. No, 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 he says you're perfectly okay, but you're going to have bone problems. He said that in 2013, he died the next month. And bone problems came in 2014 or 15. Such bone problems. And he could tell that from his homeopathic knowledge. So I have a lot of pains in my body. And he predicted that. I said, Dr. Sahib, how can you say, how can you say that I have bone problems? He said, no, it's in our genes. Mein. He could see that. For some reason, some causality, he could work out based on whatever he had asked me. And so homeopathy is a science which is really, really something different from, so the way they are looking at the person, the way, what, they, what conclusions they are drawing based on that and how they are working out the, you know, the, the line of thinking is, is unthinkable, is unthinkable. So that was my, uh, you know, and it happened. I saw it in my life. I said, this man knew this work, but he was gone by then. I think I must compliment you that despite the withdrawal uh, problems that you must have had, your motivation was so strong that you continued with that medicine. Uh, my next question was, how long did you take the medicine? And do you think, uh, and when did you stop it? And you think uh, you had recovered by then and there was no need of medicine further? No. I stopped in 2013. That was uh, for three uh, years, approximately three, three years. Three years. Three years, approximately. See you. Okay, what I feel is whether a psychiatrist gives you a medicine or a homeopathic doctor gives you a medicine, for that matter, any from any stream of medicine, it's truly not the not the say psychiatrist if he's giving you lifelong medicines. I have come across psychiatrists who don't give lifelong medicines. Like you are mentioning about this homeopathic doctor, he gave you medicines for three years and probably you are all right. So I personally feel it's more of depending from, it's more of say a doctor to doctor, what kind of treatment he gives you and for how long he gives you the treatment. Yes. So uh, I wouldn't, uh, I mean, uh, I wouldn't uh, think that psychiatry could be uh, uh, could be taken uh, with that kind of a view as uh, has been put up. So that no, was I am Dr. Vadia, not entirely against psychiatry. I'm just saying that prolonged use of psychiatric medication 
disables people. It brings all kinds of iatrogenic injuries, comorbid conditions, including diabetes, heart problems. I mean, this girl whose story I've written here, I've written that she develops lupus. I, today I just told you that she, she's told me about dementia now, and she's only 50 years old. So she's already talking, and there is, what else uh, does she have apart from that? Is there is a lupus, she and there was IBS also. IBS also, so irritable bowel syndrome. So she barely eats anything, you know. So all kinds of injuries happen to the body because of that prolonged use, and that is what is problematic. So this, the person is disab disabled because of that long-term use of medication, not the short term. I'm not going to say that you close down the psychiatric industry. It's not going to happen easily. <laughs> if it all has to happen. <laughs> but because when families are distressed, they have no alternative. They will look for an immediate, uh, you know, sort of reduction in symptoms to control somebody who's violent or whatever. I can't condone that, but the violent means, but we can do it more compassionately. And once that, that has been achieved, that, that you know, that, con that abated, that violence or that restlessness or whatever it is, we have to look for a way out of it. And we have to look by actually having the, the desire that I want to now reach the bottom of this pain. And who has the patience for that pain? Because maybe a lot of that pain is coming from the family. And who wants to deal with that? Nobody wants to deal with what their family problems are. Because that is really a problem then. Because we are looking at entrenched patriarchy, we are looking at so much of violence against women, against children, against the elderly, against everybody, against even men. So it's, it's, it's really a problem. <laughs> I think these days what we ought to practice is that well, is a very eclectic approach. You know, all these uh, different modalities of medicine, they are rather complementary to each other. I mean, uh, they, they, they are not mutually exclu exclusive and they complement each other. So probably if we take it in that spirit, uh, the the fraternity will really be helped. I wish they would do that, Dr. Yeah, Vandia. But people like you would do that perhaps. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm yeah, if sure, somebody yeah. comes to me and says, hey, I want to take Ayurvedic treatment, yeah. all I say is, okay, you finish my course first and thereafter you must try that. Or you take that course first hmm. and then you must try it. You right. should not take both of them together. So that's the kind of thing we've got to keep our minds open. Yes. I think there's something very interesting that somebody had once said to me, and I think it's so true. He said, allopathy is really amazing as emergency medicine. Yes. You know, but for chronic conditions, you know, it stops working after a point. So I think if we have that understanding in our heads that, okay, there's, a, there's, a, there's an acute situation which we have to take care of right now. You know, there's no, I mean, there's no point going to homeopathy at that point or Ayurveda or Tibetan at that point. Aparna, that also depends from uh, disease to disease. There are certain diseases which even if they are chronic, you've got to take the medicines all the time. But doctor, so, I would also say that, you know, I mean, if you look at, for instance, diabetes, for the longest time we believed that diabetes, you have to take medicines for life. Now there is so much evidence to show that if you make lifestyle changes, you make changes in diet, it can be reversed. No, that's the first step they advise you before they start the drugs. But that was if not, you are, that is new knowledge. When my no, mother no, no. was on diabetes, when she was first diagnosed, she was put on medicine. She's been on medicines her entire life. Now she's like, oh, now, I, and she has self-discovered. No doctor has told her this. Sorry, Aparna, I did my medicine. self-discovered. I did my medicine in 76. And even at that stage, the first treatment for this, uh, the diabetes was exercise. Second was diet and third was the drugs. Unfortunately, I think in the practice of it, it sort of gets missed somewhere. I have two questions. Firstly, uh, you said that while documenting the book, you, go, uh, you have interviewed several uh, patients. So by any chance, uh, did you ha uh, get a chance or opportunity to interview someone or some patient from rural background, if not for this book, in your 30 years journey? And have you observed any difference in their responses? For example, uh, it's my hypothesis or assumption, but I'm not sure that urban people are most aware of uh, the names like bipolar disorder or schizophrenia, which is not very prevalent in rural areas. So have you observed any kind of difference in acceptance in the rural patient that mujhe ye problem hai? Unhone suna bhi nahi hai. So any difference or any opportunity and B, uh, I just webinar me I I am able to understand the concept of coloniality or jo bhi hai. Hmm. Uh, how we can take you know this awareness to rural communities you know making them aware firstly the concept of mental health hmm. 
along with the concept of coloniality so that they don't fall into the trap of this you know vested interest of some institutions so i think uh, more than mental health the, the one thing which I'm actually very concerned about nowadays is not mental health, actually. I'm concerned more about justice in society. And I'm thinking, what can be more just than this, than anything? Education, mein kya justice ho sakta hai? what can be more just for women? What can be more justice for, let's say, even teaching music? Should only the children who are privileged, who have access to money and teachers, should they be the only ones singing who have good voices? Or should everyone sing? So, my issues have become totally different. So I think when we understand that if people can understand how they are oppressed by what, whether it's livelihood issues, whether it's uh, you know the, the the debt they have taken for the child's marriage or the land or something like that, bimari hui to karza lena pad gaya, you know, all of that, all of this which is oppressing the human is a cause for their grief and suffering, which can bring mental health issues. Now, there is one problem with the Mental Health Act, the new, the new law, that uh, even if you're not able to afford the medication and you just go to a psychiatric big hospital in your area or what, a district or whatever, you can be provided medication for free. So this is as per the new act. So if you go once and they know that, okay, this is the person, they, you don't even have to go again, by the way they will reach that medication to your house. This is thanks to what the WHO, the World Psychiatric <laughs> Association is doing. They are trying to increase the, the, the head count of people who are taking psychiatric medication. This is as per the law. If you can't afford the medication, it will reach your home. So they are so kind. And they are so concerned about our mental health, by the way. They don't care about health. How about giving health services to everybody for free? You won't do that, no? But you will make sure that people, so the thing is, if people can understand what's going wrong, I mean, you know, uh, they have the biggest incidence of uh, violence against women and how much of their mental health is affected. But how can we educate? This is a challenge for everybody, by the way. It's not just that I can answer this in one day. It has to be a multi-sectoral kind of a thing which we have to look and work towards. The issue is justice. When there is a lack of justice in society, in the family or anywhere else, and which is of course rampant, there will be mental health issues, there will be suffering of all kinds. What will we do about that? How far can we go? Can we empower individuals or can we just empower uh, big groups or how shall we go about it? So I am just partly uh, bringing the problem to the fore and I'm saying that, and, and perhaps the last sentence of my book is, that I don't think I'm going to work only in mental health. For me, the whole issue becomes the issue of justice. Whose justice and what kind of justice am I looking at? Because when so everybody in society is suffering, can I just talk about mental health issues of certain people who are patients? Because this society is sick right now. This is a sick world that we are living in. We are living in a sick world, really, isn't it? I just like to mention two things here, you know, so there was, uh, there were two WHO studies, in fact, that happened in the 80s, uh, which I'm sure uh, Dr. Sharma, you know about as well, where they found that the mental health outcomes of those in lower and middle income uh, countries, such as India, were much better than the mental health outcomes in developed countries, which obviously have much more access to treatment options as per psychiatry or psychology or whatever it is, right? So when, the, when they did the, uh, the study for the first time, they were so amazed by it that they actually repeated it to you know, see if they had got it wrong. But the second study also sort of reiterated the same thing. So that was, in fact, the starting point for somebody whose you know, books I totally recommend, um, Bob Whitaker, Robert Whitaker. He's, he's written and he's, he's done a great service to everyone by starting something called madinamerica.com, which is you know, a repository of very, very interesting um, uh, oppositional and, and critical articles uh, to the mainstream sort of discourse. So, so, so there's that. And I'm also reminded of this very beautiful story where, you know, there's a psychiatrist, I forget his name, he's written a book and he's talking about how he went to one of the Southeast Asian countries, either Vietnam or Cambodia. Summerfield. Yes, 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 Derek Summerfield. And, you know, he went there on a, on a mission to take psychiatry and the mental health discourse there, right? So he went and he spoke to the people and said, this is what we do when people are depressed, you know, they're feeling this way. So the people over there, they said, oh, you have psychiatry, we also have psychiatry, you know, you know what we do? 
so they're like huh, what what was it you know so he's he's amazed like he's because he's like i'm taking psychiatry like what are you talking about so they say you know for instance there was this farmer you know and um, he was really depressed so we all got together so and when we figured out why he was depressed he was depressed because he could no longer till his fields because he had lost his legs so we all got together and we bought him uh, whatever some bulls or some tractor or something right and he was no longer depressed right so this entire conversation about genetics you know this is the biomarkers and all of that you know we need to also use our common sense a lot of times you know and really question <laughs> <laughs> and you know i think it's great that now everybody is talking because post covid everybody is talking about mental health so then i really wonder where did all that conversation about genetics go then did we suddenly develop bad genes and now we're all having mental health problems we have to and and that is i think the biggest disservice psychiatry does it does not look at societal conditions the psychosocial aspect it does not look at it at all it only looks it thinks of 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 mental illness as a biological problem the my by the biomedical problem and i think that is where it has gone wrong and which is why i mean you don't have cancer patients coming and saying we hate our doctors or anything like that right but you have a user survivor movement which comes and says that you know psychiatry has harmed us so we need to listen to that one no? not yeah. dismiss that conversation um uh, uh, i wanted to ask you about the the music groups that you were talking about could you talk a little bit about that please so just uh, the plan is to have a group which beats once in a month and people can just sing together just about just relaxed and if some people are interested in being part of my further research i'm happy to have them in but my work is of course going to be a very multi-sided kind of work which is i say a second phd i'm planning i'm already finalizing the university admission process in in ireland so but i'll be sitting in india and doing the work so uh i think the whole thing is that um the goal is that can we create some spaces where people can come together because when i was a patient i knew that i could not go anywhere so i want to create an alternative for other people to at least come out of their homes in a space where they are relatively safe and they don't have to disclose their diagnosis or anything like that they are just people who are there to sing that's all So if you would like to be part of the group uh, feel free to sign up or you have the the flyers are there our addresses are there my phone numbers and everything is there so you can easily be in touch with us and say that I want to be part of the group so we'll we'll put you on the group and we'll be in touch with you subsequently Well I want to raise uh, two issues over here those who have love for the psychiatry and medicines they must love but if you want to see that psychiatry works at least visit to any of the asylum and you see the pe- people over there if psychiatry and psychiatric medicine would have ever worked certainly they would not have continued in that any asylum uh, so that is one thing and i'm seeing after uh, visiting the 26 asylum in the out of 46 in this country another thing that look mental illness itself is a breed regulatory word because the moment you use this word it not only generate a stigma it generates a lot of injustice to other person and the third point i want to make that look unfortunately in our society the psychiatry and the society both have done the biggest fraud the people have experiencing any mental health issues in their life or that they say that they are dangerous to self and the society which is the biggest fraud which has been done till now whatever the psychiatry can do and i say all for them so uh, what i want to just make here the point that look as much as possible you are a conscientious individual try to understand the dynamics behind this whole psychiatry business i'll give one example to you how uh, the psychiatry is powerful in uh, 2010 we were advocating that look why we need mental health act because we demanded the mental health 1987 act should be repealed which we got to repeal and uh, mm, and that time the mm, the late mm, desi raju was the uh, additional secretary and he was very nice person and understanding and uh, and also few ministers who were then understanding and we got repeat then we raised the question why we need a special act because disability act was already uh, in the process of getting for, uh, uh, you can say formed or uh, drafted 
So very finally, this uh, ministry agreed. Then I went to the, that time the minister was uh, Gulam Nabi Ajad. I was knowing him personally. I told him, so look, uh, this is uh, going to be uh, very, again you are going to colonize uh, or uh, institutionalize the people with this uh, and going to give advantage to the psychiatry. Will you believe this was supported by the Desi Raju and the uh, Desi Raju as a secretary, Ministry of Health, he was transferred with the help of the psychiatrist and uh, the pharmacological, uh, pharmaceutical lobby. And I remember the director general of the health services, he was questioning me that look, how you can, uh, you want, uh, how do you want to stop the whole business of the, where the millions and millions of rupees had been invested. So the question is that, that look, psychiatry, I don't know how much good it has done, but certainly I can say you that it has done worse to the people than any branches of medical sciences. And the best proof is that still asylum is existing with the help of psychiatry. Thank you. That, by the way, is Abdul Maboob. He runs an NGO called uh, Snehi. Uh, it's a very, uh, they're doing some very wonderful work in the community, especially with children and people who are suicidal. And for the last 27 years, they have been doing some wonderful work indeed. They've taken people off uh, psychiatric medication and uh, away from suicide, and people have been very, very calm, and, and they've lived very good lives, and so on and so forth. So I just thought I should say who the person is who's having so much to say, as well as intervening at the governmental and the policy levels. That's Abdul Maboob from Snehi. And on that note, I think we shall bring the evening to a close. Uh, Thank you so much, Dr. Sharma, for writing this book. Aparna, I have to ask you something. Before the book came out, you were the one person who was very keen, and she said to me that when the book comes out, I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to talk to, I mean, I'm, we're going to have a program launch or something. So why were you so enthusiastic even before you touched the book or you read the book or you saw anything about the book? I think I understood where you came from because we'd had many conversations prior to your even writing the book. Yeah, you yeah, know. Yeah. And um, I thought it was a point of view that deserved wider hearing. And um, yeah, that's really where it came So what from. do you think now that you've read the book finally? Well, I'm glad that uh, A, we have our own mad scholar <laughs> <laughs> right here in India. You know, we no longer have to look to the West. So that's one, one level of decolonization <laughs> right there. <laughs> And I feel that we need more and more such books because uh, what, it's, um, what it's questioning is a, is a behemoth, you know, and, and uh, yes, uh, this might just be, you know, David versus Goliath, may it's, it's just one, but we need many such Davids yes, to yes. come forth, to question, to critique. And I feel like the critique is good for psychiatry also. Yes, yes. Because I, I truly believe that anybody who becomes a doctor does it because they want to help people. Absolutely. You know? So yeah. I think this critique is timely, it's important, and it's for everyone's benefit. Yeah. You know? So this is not... <laughs> I think I'd like to thank everybody. We were not expecting that people, every, so many people will stay on until the very end, but I'm so grateful that you've come and made the time for this book because really uh, I had to become a psychiatric patient first, exit psychiatry. The research is just a four year PhD, but it's actually 12 years of my work. You know, which has gone into, and I wrote the book in six months. That's a different issue because not so much else had gone into it before that happened. But this is really my 30 years of life in this book. I hope, I hope there is uh, some power, some empowerment for everybody through this book. And that's my only hope. Thank you so much. Thank you.